We welcome you to another study from the Gospel of John. We're covering chapter 7 tonight. That's a lot of territory, so we're going to do a lot of Bible reading, but that's okay with me. And uh, this deals with how people respond to the testimony, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you're going to be blessed. Julia Kalma will start us off, followed by Darren Lagana, and then topping it off, Pastor Melissa Williams. Bless you, dear people, as you share the word of God. Good evening, church. I'll be reading from John 7, verses 1 to 9. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to know openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even the brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come. But your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of its evil works. Of its works, of its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Amen. When I look at this passage in John 7, 7, and it says, Jesus walked in Galilee. He did not, walk, he did not want to walk in Judea. Why? The Jews sought to kill him. It was not lack of courage that made Jesus stay in Galilee, but an awareness of the Father's perfect timing. Jesus' brother urged him to go, but he did not. Jesus rejected their arguments and went in his own time. The world cannot hate you, he said, but it hates me because I testify of it, that its works were evil. The feast of the tabernacle was at hand. This was a joyful, week-long celebration, and it's usually around September or October that they celebrate when families camp out to a temporary shelter to remember God's faithfulness to Israel in the wilderness on the way from Egypt in Canaan under Moses. There is one unique thing in this passage which we must note. According to the revised standard version in John 7, 7, Jesus frequently spoke about his time or his hour but here he uses a different word, and he uses it for the only time. In the other passages, John 2, 4, John 7, 30, John 8, 20, John 12, 27. The word that Jesus or John uses here is aura, and that's a Greek word, which means the destined hour of God. Such a time or hour was not movable nor avoidable. 
It had to be accepted without argument and without alteration because it was the hour at which the plan of God had decided that something must happen. Jesus is not saying here that the destined hour of God has not come, but something much similar. He is saying that this was not the moment which would give me the chance I am waiting for. Mm -hmm. Many people have been troubled about the fact that he first told his brothers he would not go, and then he went. Other people have argued that it means that Jesus said that he was not going up to the fest festival publicly, but did not preclude him from going privately. Mm -hmm. But Jesus is not saying, but Jesus is not saying simply, if I go up with you now, I will not get the opportunity I'm looking for. So he delayed his going until the middle of the festival. Since to arrive with the crowd, all assembled and expectant gave him for a better opportunity than to go at the very beginning. Jesus is choosing his time with careful prudence in order to get the most effective result. From this passage also, we learn two things. One, it is impossible to force Jesus' hand. His brother tried to force him into going. It was, it was what we might call a dear, like I dare you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus' brother, the next one is, Jesus' brother could have put up a good case for their insistence. But Jesus had, Jesus' hand is not to be forced. He does things not in man's time, right. but in God's wisdom. It is impossible to treat Jesus with indifference. It did not matter when his brother went, for, an, for no one would notice they were there, and nothing was supposed to happen. Whatever happened, whenever depending, they were depending on Jesus' coming, what happened? Jesus' going is a very different thing. Why? Because Jesus' brother were in tune with the world, and they did not make it uncomfortable but Jesus' is coming is a condemnation of the world's way and life and a challenge of selfishness. Jesus had to choose his moment. For when he arrives, something happened. People hate Jesus because his works expose their evil act. When we preach the gospel, people may hate us as well. Let us, not make, let us make sure that they hate us because of the gospel message, not because of our offensive personalities. 1 Peter 3.15 gives us the prescription for dealing with the world. We should be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us. Remember, in Christ Jesus, there are things to hope for. That we are in the world, but we are not of the world. So the world has a reason to ask us about our hope. Because our manner and our life is very, very attractive. We should be ready to confront the world with God's truth. Not in a confrontational manner. Commitment to Christ cannot be Halfway, it requires a single-minded intent to press on and obey him even when the going gets tough. Look, look 16, verses 16. We do not walk up with intent of ourselves, 
but it is a gift of God's grace. And it is something that we should ask the Lord to grant us continually. When we are talking about the world as an enemy, we are also talking about the falling world system that sets itself in opposition to Christ in itself. The world was originally good, Genesis 1, 1. But in the fall of Adam, it was, set as, it was against its creator. It hates Jesus because of his testimony about his fallen system of pride and ungodliness. And thus it gains the capacity to hate all who are under Christ. The, the world is a group of people that has no affection for the things of God. Yet our creator loves the world even in its selfishness. And having sent his son to save the world, commissioned us, you and I, as ambassador of grace to the world. And I reference John 3.16 John 20, 21, as those who have been sent into the world, we are tempered to adopt the world's ways. So Jesus has prayed for us that we will not be of the world. And under the sway of Satan, even as we remain in the world, and I reference John 17, 14 to 16. God does not save us, Christians, ambassadors for Christ, living for Jesus, in order to snatch us out of the world or that we might live in isolation in our own Christian ghetto. Instead, like Jesus, we are to minister in the world wherever we are, to people, no matter where they are from. As we are seeking to share the gospel with others, there will be pressure to confront to the world, to water down the gospel, so that we become more acceptable mm -hmm. in its eyes. But the message is to make it more acceptable. The answer is to remain in the world and confront the world graciously. Mm -hmm. Of course, with the truth of the gospel. First John 5, 19, Paul says, we are under the sway of three forces, the world, the devil, and the flesh. The world mentioned here is not simply cultured itself, but rather all that it's an, is hostile and opposed to God. The present evil age works its thoughts into our hearts and mind in subtle ways. So we must be discerning. God has called us to be people set apart. And you know, sometimes people look at us and say, oh, you're kind of different. Of course. I mean, we are in the world. We are not of the world. We cannot do the things we used to do. I mean, we can partake in different things. And people will call us strange. People will call us different. People will call us funny. And even in family members. Yeah. <laughs> they, they say all sorts of things. I just remember shortly, my niece... Um, I have a christening, not christening, but a birthday party for the twins she had. And I was hoping, I mean, this thing start at 2 o'clock. And I said, okay, I still will just go because family members were there and said, and I went, guess what? The kids were there eating and everything. Five o'clock, I went there. And then I hear somebody saying, Auntie Julia is here. She's going to pray. I said, 
So, you know, this is, this is man's time. Things like that is unavailable, unavoidable when you are with family members. And they expect you to stay and you will meet with all kinds of... But that's, I mean, we will be around them. But you got to remember who you are, whose you are, and why. And as I look at this passage... In another insight I would like to give you, not only are we affected by this evil age, but also by Satan himself, described as the prince of the power of the air. This devil demonstrates and energizes the spiritual dead. The devil is a real force at work in the world. And to ignore this would be to ignore scriptures, testimony of the presence and influence. We got to realize that even though this, the world is of the devil, Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. And we are, we are in the world. Like I said earlier, we're not of the world. So we should pray without ceasing. If we ambassadors of Christ following Jesus, he prayed all the time. I remember friends say, girl, you pray all the time. Each time I call you praying, you pray. But that's what we're supposed to do. So we will not be cut up with the wiles of the devil. So we will not be entangled in the things of the world. So we will not forget who we are in the mighty name of Jesus. And last, we are told we once lived in passion of our flesh. The personal dimension Paul uses when he says our flesh. The two prior forces is outside us, you and I, the world and the devil. But now we are told that there is a force of evil within this should not come to you as a shock if we believe that we are dead spiritually. We love to blame others for our sins and shortcomings. Many try to separate themselves from bad influences only to realize that their own hearts leads them astray as well. The truth is we need God to save us from ourselves. We are capable and responsible for sinful action carried out. Amen and amen. Let us open our Bibles to the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, we'll be first reading John 7, 10 through 19, and then John uh, 7, 20 through 31. And this is the response of the Jews. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, He is good. And others said to the contrary, He deceives the people. No one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, having not studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not my doctrine, but it is he who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. 
did, you, did not Moses give you the law, he said? Yet none of you keep the law. Why do you keep, seek to kill me? And the people answered and says, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers. And, your circum uh, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Amen. Amen. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he who they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do not the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know that where this man is from, but when Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, you both know me and you know where I'm from and have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him for I am from him. And he sent me. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because it was not his hour and it was not yet to come. And many of these people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, he will do more signs than these which this man has done. And we go back to verse 10. It says that when his brothers had gone up, he also went up to the feast. And it said not openly. But it was in secret. See, Jesus knew the, realer, the rulers really wanted to kill him. So he shows up in the middle of the week. He catches the leaders off guard. It's unexpected. And they're neutralized by the public exposure that Jesus already has. Bear in mind, this is his time. And his time is precise. Back in verse 6, Jesus uh, uh, said that earlier because he said, my time has not yet come. In verse 8, he says, my time has not yet fully come. Jesus was on a divine timetable, not man's. Now in verse 11, the Jews were seeking him at the feast saying, where is he? Where is he? But yet Jesus waits till midweek and he re-enters. Jesus faces a world that hates him. He faces Jerusalem where the leaders have already determined to execute him. He puts his life on the line. And at the right moment and the right time, he walks into the temple. The time was about 29 AD, roughly around... If we had to think about it October 15th. And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. And others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives people. Notice the big debate began before Jesus even arrived into the city. This debate centered on the very character of Christ. And while the religious leaders were seeking him, the crowd kept arguing whether he was a good man or a deceiver. Jesus provokes that same type of controversy today as he did when he was on the earth. But those who truly know him realize he is good. However, no one spoke openly of him for the fear of the Jews. This kind of talk that went on was guarded whispers because of the intimidating Jewish leaders. No one would speak openly lest they arouse suspicion that they were followers of Jesus and endanger their own lives. And then it says, now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. With the feast almost half over, Jesus shows up and starts teaching. Note, 
the hostility did not stop Jesus from teaching his ministry. Mm -hmm. Many will pack up their bags and when things get a little tough, but Jesus relentlessly set forth the claim regarding his identity and his mission here on this earth. And the Jews marveled saying, how does this man know letters having not yet studied? And the Jews were amazed at what he was taught because he did not have any credentials. See, that's what the Jews, that's what they, the religious people look for. Well, he doesn't have any credentials. There's no endorsements on this man. No approval by the rabbinical schools. To them, they had no proper accreditation. To his enemies, the teachings were nothing but private interpretations. And Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but him who sent me. Notice the debate shifted from his character to his doctrine. It was all about his character. Remember, they, they said, you know, can any good thing come from, from his hometown? You know, they, they, were, they were really not trying to point the finger at Jesus, but his character. And then they turned to his doctrine. But Jesus' teachings were measured by its source. And Jesus explained that his doctrine came from the Father. Mm -hmm. Jesus made it perfectly clear. He said, he and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. If anyone wills to, to do his will, he said, known concerning this doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak of my own authority, and those committed to doing God's work will be guided by the declaration of his truth. Mm -hmm. See, God's truth is self-authenticating. Mm -hmm. Though the teaching ministry, through the uh, teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, he who speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. See, while others acted in their own self-interest, Jesus Christ came solely to glorify the Father and to accomplish the Father's will. Did not Moses give to you the law, yet none of you keep the law, he said? Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? But yet all through scriptures it tells you that he was being sought to be killed. Here our Lord uses a very law of Moses to refute the enemy's argument. But he already knows that they wouldn't give in. Why? Because their standard of judgment was not honest. They judged on things and how they seem and not on how things are. The Bible tells us to be carnally minded is enmity. And to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Mm -hmm. And they were thinking with a carnal mind. They were thinking of a natural attitude. These religious leaders were only wanting and desiring one thing. And that was ma money, mammon. That's all they sought after. Mm -hmm. They were in that circle of religious people that when they went into the temple, they said, oh, well, I taught under Rabbi so-and-so. And they just spun that around all the time, talking about I, this teaching comes from rabbi, as though he was a significant source. But Jesus said, I taught of one source, and it's God alone, and he's my father, and he gave me them words. And that's the power of God. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from our fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so the law of Moses should be broken, why are you angry with me? Because I made a man completely whole on the Sabbath. Jesus was saying to you, you healed one part of a person's body on the Sabbath. I healed a whole person and I'm guilty? I created the Sabbath for man. And we look at James 2.10, it says, For whoever would keep the law but stumble in one point was guilty of violating the whole law. Mm -hmm. See, the law was set up to condemn men, 
so that they could see the Jesus Christ, so that they could come to him, so that they would have an advocate with the Father. Do not judge according to the appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Here Jesus demanded that they exercise moral and theological discernment in making sound decisions. But they wouldn't. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, It is not he whom they seek to kill, but look, he speaks boldly. And they say nothing to him. And they went on and they said, However, we know that this man is where this man is from and that Christ comes, but no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cries out as he taught in the temple saying, you both know me. And they went on to say, therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, he will do more signs than these which this man has done. Once again, John reiterates the claim that Jesus' identity as Messiah, as the Son of God. Also, I want to bring to your attention, it was John the Baptist who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Then there was Andrew in John chapter 1. It says, We found the Christ. We found the Messiah. There was Philip who said, We found him on whom Moses spoke. There was Nicodemus who came to Jesus on behalf of other people and said, We know that you are a teacher come from God because no one can do what you do unless God is with him. And there was also the Samaritans from that little village of Sychar, who basically concluded, this is indeed the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And there was Peter and the disciples in chapter 669 who said, we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It was also Peter who said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I present to you this evening, whom do you say he is? Amen. Amen. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I thank God for the grace given to me tonight to teach the last 22 verses of John chapter 7. This section focuses on the response of the rulers and authorities of Jesus being a rabble rouser. The great claim of Jesus and divided opinions about him. With your Bibles already open to John, I will begin reading at verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come? On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Verse 40. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? 
Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought him? The officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. Saints, it's hard to believe that Jesus was being accused of being a rabble-rouser, but he was. A rabble-rouser is a person who speaks with the intention of inflaming the emotions of a crowd of people, a troublemaker, and this is who the Pharisees judge Jesus to be. In verse 32, it says that the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. What things were the Pharisees hearing the crowd say about Jesus that caused them and the chief priests to send officers to take him? They heard many other people were believing on Jesus. He was a threat to their security and position, esteem and authority, profession and livelihood. So they wanted to get rid of him as soon as possible. Verses 33 and 34. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Can you imagine how baffled the people were by what Jesus said? He was predicting his death. I shall be with you a little while longer. And he was predicting his resurrection and ascension. Then I go to him who sent me. Jesus concluded by predicting a tragic future for those who opposed him and wanted nothing to do with him. You will seek me and not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. He meant that he would not be found by the hostile examiner, those intending to arrest him, silence him, or kill him, nor will the unbeliever find Christ because it will be too late. Proverbs 1, 24 through 28. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Church, Jesus meant what he said, but it didn't stop the Jews from asking the following questions among themselves in verse 35. Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? How true it is that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can they know them because they are spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. Devoid of any spiritual perception, these Jews were unable to understand Christ's reference to his return to heaven. When they inquired, does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, they were referring to those Jews who were scattered all over the world. The Greek word is diaspora, and it signifies the dispersion. It seems that the rulers thought Jesus was going to leave Israel and go to some foreign nation and preach to the Jews there. In verse 36, still talking amongst themselves, they ask, What is this thing that he said? You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Now, it's believed that these men were not illiterate, but educated men with religious training. 
But how many of us know that no amount of culture or religious instruction can impart spiritual understanding to the most intelligent person? Quoting A.W. Pink, a man must be divinely illumined before he can perceive the meaning and value of the things of God. The truth is that the most illiterate babe in Christ has a capacity to understand spiritual things which an unregenerate university graduate does not possess. Now let's move on to the great claim of Jesus. There were divided opinions about him then, and I'm sure you would agree that there are still divided opinions about Christ today. A little background information. The feast mentioned here in verse 37 is the Feast of Tabernacles. It is one of several feasts that God instituted for the Israelites to follow. Through these feasts, the Jewish people celebrated their history, their faith, and the blessings of God. It was done to remember God's deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt. It was also called the Feast of Ingathering, Exodus 23 and 16, and the Feast of the Lord, Leviticus 23 and 29. So it was on the last day of the feast, for the feast was celebrated for seven days, that Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Three words stand out, thirst, come, and drink. The first tells us a recognized need, thirst. Thirst is like hunger. It's something we are keenly aware of that we know we all need. There is a soul thirst as well as a bodily thirst. Sadly, so many thirst for that which cannot truly satisfy them. Their thirst is for the things of the world in which Christ tells them whoever drinks that water will still thirst again. However, in verse 37, Christ is speaking of that intense longing for himself, which only the Spirit of God can create in the soul. Happy is the man who truly recognizes what he is thirsting for and can say like the psalmist in 42, 1 and 2, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The second word, come means to approach an object or person. It expresses action and implies that a person has made a choice and it's valid. To come to Christ means that you are coming to him and to none other. You have turned your back on the world and have abandoned all confidence in everything about yourself and have given your life over to him. The third word, drink. Christ not only said, come to me, but he added, and drink. A river flowing through a country where people are dying of thirst benefits them nothing if they don't drink it, right? Jesus explained what he meant by the metaphor of drinking. To come to Jesus and to drink was essentially to put one's faith in him, their trust in him, to rely on him for everything and forever. Rivers of living water refer to the Holy Spirit. When Jesus spoke of giving living water, he meant he would give the Holy Spirit to a person, which Jesus explains in the next verse. And for the record, it is only the person who believes in Jesus that will receive the Holy Spirit. Belief in Jesus is key. Belief in Jesus is the only way. Christ's living water does at least three things in the life of a believer. It cleanses or purifies, it refreshes, and it revitalizes or energizes. When the apostle John said that the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, he meant that the Holy Spirit was not yet publicly manifested on the earth. The Spirit's manifestation was subsequent to the glorification of Christ. In other words, the Holy Spirit was not present in all his fullness in the lives of the believers all the time and not equipping believers with permanent spiritual gifts. However, we know that that is not the end of the story. After Christ was glorified, the Holy Spirit entered the world in all his fullness at Pentecost. He entered the lives of believers at their conversion, and their bodies became the temple of the living God. 
He's also equipping believers with spiritual gifts that are permanent, 1 Corinthians 12 and 7. How many of you in here tonight know what your spiritual gift is? I hope you're gifting it to Calvary. In verses 40 through 44, the crowd now starts to question who Jesus really was. Was he a prophet? Was he the Christ? They even question if Christ would come out of Galilee. There are many religions today, like Islam, Jehovah Witnesses, and Mormons, who, like these men of old, question the Lord's origin and continue in unbelief because of it. When they look at Jesus, they see a man, but only a man. They see and believe that he was flesh and blood, but not God incarnate in human flesh. So it's not surprising that there was a division among the people because of him. John 1, 10 and 11 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Interesting fact. If you read through the book of Acts, you will see the divisions, the preaching of the apostles caused. I wouldn't be surprised if there are many of us in here tonight, because of our belief in Jesus, that we have had divisions with our family members, with our friends, and even with our co-workers. What I find even more interesting in verse 44 is they wanted to take hold of Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him. And do you want to know why? Because they were powerless. They had a will to, but not the ability Jesus said to Pilate in John 19 and 11, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. They may have had a desire to arrest Christ, but they were not given power from above to do so. Beloved, God is in control of everything and everyone. We should never forget that. Amen. In verses 45 through 53, we see that the leaders wish to be rid of Jesus, but the temple police were greatly impressed with his teaching. To them, he was a great teacher. Verse 46, no man ever spoke like this man. What a testimony that is from an unbeliever. Instead of arresting Jesus, they had been arrested by what they heard him say. It was not his miracles which so deeply impressed them, but his speech. No man has ever spoke like Christ because his words were spirit and life. Has his word come to you with a force like no other pastor or preacher? Has his word brought life to your soul, joy to your heart, rest to your conscience, and peace to your mind? I feel like shouting. Can't no one speak with me like Jesus. Hallelujah. For he does walk with me and talk with me along life's narrow way. Amen. In verses 47 through 49, the leaders are now claiming Jesus was a deceiver. There were even a few men of eminent standing, scribes, and Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, who were numbered among the followers of Jesus. So hence the question, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? To their surprise, there were. The leaders maintained that the people were mistaken and cursed because they followed Jesus. They were too well satisfied with themselves to see any need of a savior. The leaders rejected Jesus so strongly that Nicodemus finally spoke up in verses 50 through 51. He charged the leaders with breaking the law themselves, and it was sufficient enough to break up their conversation about Jesus, but now they were focused on him. In verses 51 and 52, the Pharisees are now asking Nicodemus, aren't you also from Galilee? The leaders used scripture as the basis for rejecting Christ. They said no scripture pointed to a prophet coming out of Galilee, and oh, were they wrong. Their own scriptures discredited them, for in 2 Kings 14 and 25, it says that God has spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath which is in Galilee. Beloved, God is able to raise up prophets from wherever he chooses. Amen? In verse 52, everyone went to his own house, meaning every man mentioned throughout this chapter. The feast was over. Everyone went to his own house, 
away from Christ, they departed. God does not force anyone, any person, to subject themselves to his son. Everyone has the freedom to live as he wishes, either for God or for himself. I pray that's not anyone in here tonight. But if it is, I implore you to give your heart to Jesus. I promise you, your life will never be the same. God bless you all. Good night and amen. Tabernacle.